I can fix things. You can also destroy everything. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Flash. We are so excited to break this film down for you. It is like the absolute most DC film I have ever seen. So, the film begins with the logos for both Warner Brothers and DC, but to play on the time travel nature of this story, we see past versions of the logos morphing into the new versions until reaching their present day designs. The opening scene of the film is very reminiscent of this deleted Flash scene from the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. The scene even opens with Barry saying how late he is, just like in the Snyder Cut. I'm so sorry, I'm late. The film opening with Barry being late to work reminds me a lot of the opening to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Peter is late to work because of the responsibilities of being Spider-Man. But what makes Barry being late even more poetic is that he's the fastest man alive, but he's still late. We see Barry look down at his watch, which is giving him a low calorie alert. Now this is a reference to his very fast metabolism and how he requires a lot of sustenance to maintain his super speed. Barry, go find Alfred in the pantry. Barry's phone rings and we see Alfred's name along with an animated butler picture that looks a lot like Alfred from Batman the Animated Series. And then we get the triumphant return of Jeremy Irons as Alfred Pennyworth. He's calling Barry to let him know that Batman needs a hand. We then hear Barry ask Alfred why Superman or Wonder Woman or any other members of the Justice League can't come help. Alfred says that Superman is busy and Wonder Woman can't be reached, similar to this scene in Far From Home. What about Thor? Off world. Okay, um, Doctor Strange. Unavailable. We get a brief glimpse of Henry Cavill's Superman fighting a volcano, but we don't see his face. Likely because Cavill is out as the Man of Steel, something that our own Colton Ogburn is still crying about. We then see Barry make his way to the bathroom to change. Well, not so much to change. He could change so fast that nobody would even notice, but more so to make it look like he didn't vanish from thin air when he speeds away. After he suits up, we hear for the first time in the DCEU history, Barry referred to as The Flash. <laughs> He said it! He said it! And we actually already saw where Barry got the idea to call himself The Flash over in the CW's DC Universe when Ezra Miller's Flash made a cameo alongside Grant Gustin's Flash. The Flash? The Flash? The Flash? Oh, hey there! Do you have the Stepford Wives? I can't find it anywhere on streaming and, well, I thought it'd be fun to come to a video store to rent it. Kind of retro, you know? Actually, we do. But if you want to find it on streaming, you should try NordVPN. Why whatever do you mean? Oh, well, I mean, have you ever noticed that there's a ton of movies and shows that are just really hard to find on streaming? Like you have to subscribe to like 10 streaming services and then none of them have that one Spider-Man movie you want to watch? I hear that, man. Happens to me all the time. Well, just about any movie you can think of is streaming on Netflix, but maybe just not in the United States. So you can change your computer's IP address to another country with NordVPN. They're the sponsor of this video. Then it's easy to watch Spider-Man on Netflix Netflix via another country where it's streaming. It's like adding free streaming sites on top of the ones that you're already paying for. Okay then, you've lost my business thanks to NordVPN. That's right. We don't want your money. It's no good here. Plus, NordVPN has a new feature called Threat Protection, which protects you from malicious sites, downloads, trackers, and intrusive ads. Like for instance, if you click on a suspicious attachment in your email, don't worry. Threat Protection deletes the download before it finishes, protecting your desktop from getting infected. And now, it's the only ad blocker that I use. And today, we've got a special deal for our subscribers. If you go to nordvpn.com slash screen crush or click the link in the description and purchase a two-year plan, you get one month for free plus a huge discount and you can take advantage of their 30-day money-back guarantee. Back to the Easter eggs. Notice that this girl who is a huge Flash fan is actually wearing two Flash pins on her jacket. Now she's actually secret casting of another speedster from the comics who might get powers in a future movie. This is your mom. Barry runs from Central City to Gotham City to help Batman. Now in the comics, Central City is the Gotham City to Barry's Batman or the Metropolis to a Superman. It's his own fictional city. And speaking of Superman, this scene of Barry running across different terrains was very reminiscent of Superman's first flight in Man of Steel. So, the skinny of it is that a deadly virus has been stolen by some bad guys, a virus that could wipe out a significant portion of the population. We then see Ben Affleck's Batman pursuing the bad guys on his bat cycle. This bat cycle looks very similar to the bat pod from Nolan's Dark Knight films, difference being that the bat pod had two fat tires, whereas the bat flex cycle has dual tires in the front and one fat tire in the back. Barry asks why Batman seems to be fleeing the scene and he explains to Barry that he is chasing the bad guys and that he needs Barry to save the people in the hospital. When mentioning the bad guys, we hear Batman refer to Falcon 
Falcone's idiot kid being the leader of this robbery gone wrong. Now, Falcone is a classic mob boss Batman villain that we have seen in prior films like Batman Begins and The Batman. Now, in typical Batfleck fashion, we see Batman using guns. Now, these guns are connected to his bike, but in his defense, the no-killing bail Batman also had guns on his bat pod. Barry goes to the flooding basement of the hospital to keep electrical wires from touching the water, and when he zooms back outside, we see him shake off like a wet dog. It is the most efficient method for drying off and isn't loud and scary like your stupid hair dryer. Fair enough. And by the way, everybody, if you like what we do here at the channel, then please check out our merch store at the link in the description, where we have a ton of Speedster-inspired shirts like Doug playing Fetch, the Be Kind Don't Rewind, and this really fun Doug, you want to play Fetch? Let's play Fetch shirt. Our merch store is a great way to continue to support our channel. Plus, we have a podcast that's up on all the things and on our TikTok and Instagram. We're always making new videos that you can't find here on YouTube. So subscribe to all of that and thank you for supporting our channel. We see Barry begin helping civilians and moving them out of the way of the now collapsing hospital. He helps one citizen who just runs off after Barry saves them, to which Barry says, you're welcome. Reminding the audience that being a superhero can be a thankless job. As the hospital continues to collapse, we see the building begin to lean. Now, in the maternity ward, there are babies on rolly cars for some reason, and as the building leans, they all begin to roll out the window and fall from the building. Alfred sees this and says, it's a baby, and Barry cuts in to say, shower, a baby shower. Anyway, we then see Barry enter the Speed Force and everything around him slows down and the scene takes on a yellow hue to match Flash's new yellow lightning. And that's something we actually should talk about. The Flash now has yellow lightning instead of blue lightning like in the previous films. Flash's lightning is naturally blue, but his new suit changes the color of his lightning from blue to yellow. Later in the film, we learn that this is because the suit dissipates energy, helping Flash not to overcharge while he's conjuring the Speed Force. And while we're on the topic, the Speed Force is essentially an in-universe cosmic force that is responsible for pushing time and space. Space, giving all of existence motion. Flash's ability to harness the speed force is what gives him the ability to move very fast and to travel beyond the speed of light and forward and backward in time. Back to the falling babies. This opening action sequence is one of the greatest opening sequences I have ever seen in a superhero movie. It is so great that they even made a pop figure of it. As Flash runs up the building to catch the babies, we first see him go for a vending machine to boost his calories. After increasing his energy, we see him begin to rescue the babies in a slow motion scene very reminiscent to the classic Quicksilver scene from the X-Men films. I I love the attention to detail here. Later in the movie, we hear Barry teach his younger self that you can move objects, but not people, because if you move a person, well, <laughs> as the babies are falling through midair, we see the maternity nurse who is also falling, and one of the babies recreates the classic Michelangelo painting, The Creation of Adam. This could be a reference to this film being the very first Flash film, just like in theology, Adam was the first man. Plus, we're dealing with newborn babies here who were recently created. As Barry moves other objects during this slow motion scene, you'll notice that there's a blue flare around them, once again revealing the true color of the Speed Force. Now, this is yet another scene that reminds me of the Sam Raimi films. In Spider-Man 3, we see a building hit by a crane and one of the top floors collapse, sending lots of debris falling as well as one Gwendolyn Stacy. In this scene, we get to see Spider-Man maneuver through objects mid-air and dive through this piece of debris. And in The Flash, we see an almost identical scene of Flash diving through a tight space mid-fall to save the babies. Flash complains that he's always doing the mop-up work, but remember, Batman gave Barry this advice in the Justice League. Save one person. Because, like, this is what only Barry can do. And, by the way, that advice hits a lot harder now that we know that there was a guy that Barry couldn't save during Zod's attack. We then hear Flash say that he understands this entire experience was likely very jarring for her and that he recommends seeking a therapist to assist her with processing this traumatic event. And that the Justice League doesn't quite have that part down yet. A reference to the fact that every member of the Justice League has had one or more traumatic events happen to them and they've lost a loved one or many loved ones. In short, they all need therapy. Cut back to Batman and then we see him catch up with one of the bad guys black SUVs. He makes his way into the car and basically recreates this scene from Deadpool. <laughs> After Batman beats everybody up, we see the car fly off the bridge. Batman then catches the one remaining bad guy who is also holding on to the stolen virus. And then, cue the music. In comes Wonder Woman, who we last saw make a cameo appearance in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. She uses her lasso of truth to catch Batman and the baddie and pull them up to the bridge. When Wonder Woman and Batman greet each other, there is totally some flirtatious chemistry going on. And it actually made me a little sad thinking about how we'll never actually get to see these two share the screen again. Flash zooms, and when Wonder Woman greets him, he's unable to speak and just awkwardly smiles. A callback to this scene from the Justice League. Hi, Barry. I'm Diana. 
That's not right. We then get one of the funniest scenes in the film where Batman starts vomiting some truth bombs. And my favorite was his admission to having childhood trauma and how he'd probably serve society better if he just used his money to end poverty. Now he quickly tries to get the rope off and when Flash tries to help him, he blurts out, I know sex exists, I've just never experienced it. Virgin Flash confirmed. Then Barry finally gets to the crime lab, the job we saw him get at the end of the Justice League. It's actually the worst job you can get in a crime lab. This is like a job, job. Job, job. When he gets to work, we meet Albert and Patty, and I wouldn't exactly call them Barry's friends. I need friends. They're really nasty to him, so I guess work colleagues are probably more accurate. Patty first appeared in the DC special series number one in 1977. Like in the film, Patty is a colleague of Barry's and eventually went on to become a superhero in her own right named Hot Pursuit. Albert first appeared in showcase number 13 in 1958 and was originally a chemist with a personality disorder. One of his evil personalities then used his scientific knowledge to turn himself into the villain known as Mr. Element and then later into Dr. Alchemy. And both of these characters appeared in the CW Flash series. We hear Albert poke fun at Barry and say that if it were up to Barry, they'd still be analyzing Bundy's molars. Bundy, of course, is in reference to Ted Bundy, the infamous serial killer. As Barry is leaving the crime lab, he runs into Iris West. Now, we've actually met this Iris West before in the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. And despite the theatrical cut of the Justice League being what DC considers canon, we actually hear Iris reference her scene from the Snyder Cut. She says to Barry that she feels like they ran into each other not too long ago, meaning that on a subconscious level, she recognized Barry in her brief encounter with the Flash. Barry's dad calls him from Iron Heights Penitentiary. Now, Iron Heights is a prison we have seen many times in the DC comics and is primarily used to house foes of the Flash. It's basically the Flash's Arkham Asylum. While on the phone, Barry shares the news with his dad that the security cam footage was a bust. Now, during this phone call, we see Barry is really upset and he runs to his old home where he has a flashback memory about the day his mom died. In the flashback, Barry is wearing a Scooby-Doo Mystery Machine shirt. And I'd hope this was foreshadowing that we'd see Barry and Keaton's Batman team up to do some detective work and figure out who killed his mom. But nope, it doesn't happen. They never reveal who killed Barry's mom, and Barry seems to not even be that concerned with who the mystery killer was. And I gotta be honest, this feels like a major plot hole in this story. But don't worry, we got a video coming up talking about who may have killed Barry's mom, so stay tuned. In this flashback, we see Barry doing math homework. He's stuck on a problem where he's asked to think of as many equations as he can that equal 24. Barry correctly points out that there are an infinite number of equations that could equal 24. This foreshadows the infinite nature of the multiverse. While struggling with the math problem, we hear Barry's mother say that not every problem has a solution. Now this wise piece of advice from his mother plays a major role later in the film when Barry has to accept that he needs to let her go, and when he has to convince his younger self that he has to let go too. As Barry snaps back to reality, oh the girl's gravity, oh the girl's gravity, <laughs> Doug, he finds himself enraged and full of heavy emotions. He lost his mother and father in the same day, and the beautiful life full of happy memories and cherished moments that he should have had was ripped away from him. As his rage swells, he begins to run, and as he runs, he gets faster and faster and approaches the speed of light, and then he surpasses that speed, sending him back to what honestly looks like the quantum realm. Time begins to move very differently, and we see his body begin to stretch, and then boom, he breaks through and finds himself in what he comes to call the Chrono Bowl, a sphere that surrounds him as he runs through time, and surrounding him is what I can only describe as a coliseum. But instead of there being a crowd, we see the moments from Barry's day, the day we just experienced with him from the start of the film. Now, chrono is in reference to chronometry, the science of time measurement. We also have chronological, which means the order in which events take place, just like how the Chrono Bowl presents to Barry events from his life in chronological order. Another cool detail is that his legs are no longer running in a forward motion. They're moving backwards. When Flash stops running, he can see a series of moments from the baby shower earlier in the film. He pops his head out of the bowl and into this moment. This makes him realize that not only can he observe his past events, but he can enter them. Cut to Barry having a conversation with Bruce about his plan to travel back in time. I can fix things. You could also destroy everything. We hear Bruce mention how dangerous it is and cites the classic step on the wrong blade of grass argument. This example is frequently used when discussing the effects of time travel. For example, if you travel back in time and step on the wrong blade of grass, you risk Germany winning World War II. Oh, that got dark. And then we hear Barry mention the butterfly effect. Oh yeah, that movie with Ashton Kutcher. Right? Remember that movie? There was a weird deleted scene where like he actually strangled himself in the womb. Very strange. So the butterfly effect is the theory that there is a dependence upon small details that if changed can result in massive changes later 
down the line. That small change grows and grows at a rapid rate that can result in a vastly different future. Or, as we learned in The Flash, it can change the past as well. We then hear Bruce talk to Barry about how our scars make us who we are, but that we don't have to let tragedy define us. And I loved getting to see a Batman who has come to terms with his trauma, the death of his parents, and how much of a role that played in his growth as a person. This scene also showed us how similar of an origin Bruce and Barry have. They were both essentially orphaned at a young age, and it was the loss of their parents that led them both down the path of becoming a hero. Bruce explains to Barry that him allowing his tragedy to define who he is has resulted in him being alone, and Barry says that they should hang out. Now, this shows us that Barry is alone too. His mom is dead, his dad's in prison, his friends suck, I could go on. His obsession to prove his father's innocence perfectly mirrors Batman's obsession to avenge his parents' death. After Bruce leaves, we see Iris West arrive and ask if she can come up to Barry's apartment to talk about his dad's trial. Barry speed cleans his apartment in less time than it took Iris to walk up the stairs, and getting to see Barry use his powers for non-superhero activities was really neat. We've never really gotten to spend any intimate time with this version of the character. Also, Barry lives across the street from Wiz Comics, probably named after Marvel's The Wizard, another speedster from the 1940s. We see Barry offer Iris a drink, and when he realizes that he doesn't have anything in the fridge, we see him phase into his neighbor's apartment to steal some beer. Now, this is the first time we've seen the Flash use this phasing ability in the films. Phasing is basically when Flash vibrates his body at a speed that allows his atoms to pass through the atoms of other objects. This is an ability that we've seen Barry use in the Flash TV series and, of course, in the comics. On the wall, we can see a poster of model and actress Raquel Welch in her famous cave girl outfit. Now, Raquel Welch has actually appeared in a DC project before. She played the villain Dinah Stride in 1995's Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Clark Kent is Superman. But of course, a lot of you probably know this poster from its role in the Shawshank Redemption. What say there, fussy britches? This Easter egg is a lot of fun because in Shawshank, the poster concealed an escape tunnel. So here, Barry phases through it. When Barry opens his beer, it spews all over him from being shook up when he phased it through the wall with him. I love the attention to detail the filmmakers had when making this movie. During Barry's conversation with Iris, we see him discover what he thinks is a loophole to bring his mom back to life. If he goes back in time to make it to where his mom never forgot the can of tomatoes in the store, then his dad would have never had to leave to go get them, and the assumed intruder who killed his mom never would have broken in in the first place. But surely he gives it a little more thought before just really nearly traveling back and tampering with space time. Nope. Barry re-enters the Chrono Bowl, and we see events from his life begin to pass by. We see the Jet from Justice League, Wonder Woman jumping with her sword, swinging towards Steppenwolf, the Justice League fighting Superman after resurrecting him, Bruce Wayne recruiting Barry for the first time, and we can even hear Bruce say, So you're fast. Barry arrives back in time at the grocery store his mom went to that morning, and he places the forgotten can of tomatoes back into her buggy, and it works works. As Barry runs back through time, headed back to the present day, though, we see a brand new future unfolding before his eyes. Barry's birthdays, graduation, first time shaving, all major events in his life that he didn't get to share with his family. And then comes Dark Flash. As Barry is making his way back to the present, he is encountered by a dark figure with a purple speed force lightning. This figure is standing up in the Coliseum alongside Barry's new memories. We see this dark figure make its way toward Barry, and it knocks him out of the Chrono Bowl. So, in the comics, there is a character called Dark Flash. His name is Walter West, not to be confused with Wally West, who is Barry Allen's nephew and a very popular Flash in his own right. Walter is basically a version of Wally from a different dimension, a darker dimension. In his reality, he was unable to save his girlfriend from death. In the comics, Dark Flash is also from a place called the Dark Multiverse, which is essentially a shadow of the primary DC multiverse, a place where anything bad that can happen, happens. As Barry lands outside the Chrono Bowl, he finds himself on the street he grew up on right outside his house. When he goes in, we hear Barry's dad say, is that Barry? Early? What universe? is this? A fun wink and a nod to the fact that Barry has created a brand new flow of time. Barry thinks that he is in the present day and for some reason believes that this means that he won't have to worry about running into his younger self because he's traveled back to the exact moment he came from and then he will take over as the Barry Allen of the timeline. Sort of like how in X-Men Days of the Future Past we saw Wolverine's consciousness go back to the future that it came from and take over the body of a Wolverine who had already lived all those years between 1973 and 2023. But Barry's physical body is traveling through time and space. Not just his consciousness, that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand where you're going with that, guys. Sure, it doesn't make any sense, but we are going to do a whole video breaking down how time travel works in this movie. So, while Barry is sitting down with his mom and dad for dinner, we see younger Barry arrive. This is when Barry finds out that it's actually the year 2013, and this is his younger self, who is a freshman in college. In his childhood bedroom, we can see posters for other Warner Brothers films like 2013's Pacific Rim and 2010's Inception. And I also spotted a V for Vendetta poster in there, too. Younger Barry is very immature and stoner-like, and while he's annoying, he 
he's a really funny take on the character and shows us how different Barry would have been had he not been through our Barry's tragedy. While Barry 1 is showing Barry 2 his speed force abilities by quickly building a couch cushion fort, we see Barry notice mid-run that this version of himself is using the stuffed monkey that their mom gave them as a dartboard target. In Barry's timeline, this monkey is a precious item that he cherishes, but in Barry 2's timeline, it's just another toy that his mom gave him throughout the years. Now, like I said a second ago, the rules of time travel in this film can get a bit wonky. When Barry 1 finds out that today is September 29th, 2013, the day that he got his superpowers, he fears that if his younger self doesn't get powers, then that means that he won't get superpowers. Maybe. The key word is maybe. The use of the word maybe is to show, one, that Barry isn't sure how all this works and behaved recklessly, and two, to explain away anything that might become too convoluted. Barry 1 and Barry 2 make their way to the crime lab where Barry got his powers that very night. In the comics, Barry got his powers when lightning struck the lab he was working in and then it splashed him with all these chemicals. The lightning and the chemical mixtures infused with Barry and gave him super speed. This is exactly what happens in the DCEU as well. We even heard mention of this scene in the Justice League. You got struck by lightning, huh? I, yeah, that's the abridged version. I... So Barry and Barry make their way to the lab and we get to see Barry 1 recreate the exact scenario from the night he was struck by lightning. And this was so cool to see since we never actually got to see the Flash's origin story in these films. The lightning striking Barry seems to reverse his original strike and takes away his powers. But for Barry 2, it's successful and now he has super speed. After the lightning strike, Barry 2 is kind of out of it. So Barry 1 is having to drag him out before they're caught by security. Barry 1 tries to phase them through a wall and it doesn't work. This is when it starts setting in for Barry 1 that he's lost his powers. So he tries to see if he can run very fast and we get a very meta call out to how funny the DCEU's Flash looks when he runs. Barry losing his powers was yet another reminder for me of the classic Raimi Spider-Man films. In Spider-Man 2, we see Spider-Man lose his powers. <laughs> This causes Spider-Man to take a real close look at himself and analyze his priorities in life. Taking away his powers made the story even more so about Peter Parker than it was Spider-Man, and it made him have to decide whether or not he wanted to become Spider-Man again. Which of course he does, and he realizes that he, as Peter Parker, is Spider-Man and that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. And we see a similar situation unfold in The Flash. Barry's loss of his powers causes him to do some true self-reflection, and makes him realize that even without his powers, he is still The Flash. Because sure, his super speed is a pretty crucial part to him being a superhero, but it was his life journey and tragedy as Barry Allen that really made him a hero. They finally make it back to Barry 2's apartment, and Barry 1 is surprised by how nice it is. A call back to earlier in the film when Iris West says that she's surprised how neat and tidy Barry 1's apartment is. I'm not gonna lie, it's a lot tidier in here than I expected. This is more than just a gag, though. This shows the juxtaposition between these two characters. The Barry Allen who lost his mom has a messy apartment, but the Barry who still has his mom has a nice and clean apartment because his mom helps him keep it that way. Once again, it's these attentions to detail that really make this film work on a character level. In Barry 2's apartment, we see a poster for another Warner Brothers movie, Mars Attacks, a 1996 film directed by Tim Burton, the director of the two Michael Keaton Batman films, giving us a subtle hint that we're now in the timeline where Michael Keaton is Batman. The desktop top wallpaper on Barry's computer is Looney Tunes, another Warner Brothers IP. Barry 2 is starting to come out of his post-lightning strike haze and asks Barry if they're always this hungry, showing us that with his new powers, his metabolism has already started moving at super speeds. And this is when it sets in for Barry 2 that, oh wait, I have superpowers. Barry 1 tries to tell him to listen to him so he can teach him some things that he learned the hard way. But Barry 2 in Barry 2 fashion does not listen. He hikes up his leg like the Looney Tunes character Speedy Gonzalez, and Barry 1 says, Speedy Gonzalez, yeah, I used to do that too. And before he can say anything else, Barry 2 speeds away and the song All Right by Supergrass begins to play. And they really could not have chosen a better song for this young carefree version of Barry to run for the first time. Yeah, yeah. After causing several car wrecks, setting his clothes on fire from the sheer speed and causing a citywide blackout, we see Barry return home, but naked. And that is when Barry 1 mentions to Barry 2 his original polycarbon suit, a callback to this scene from the Justice League. Silica-based sand quartz fabric. Abrasion resistant, heat resistant. Uh, yeah, I do competitive ice dancing. In the Justice League movie, Barry served as the young, inexperienced comedic relief. But in this film, with us having two Barry Allens, the younger Barry is able to take on that role and give our Barry the ability to become the adult in the room. So one of the first major changes Barry notices after having changed the flow of time is that Michael J. Fox no longer played Marty McFly in Back to the Future. Instead, Marty is played by Eric Stoltz. Eric Stoltz is best known for his film The Mask and also this guy in Pulp Fiction. Look, you brought it here and that means that you're gonna give it a shot. 
The day that I bring an ODM bitch to your house, then I give her the shot. Give her the shot. But Eric Stoltz actually was cast as Marty McFly and filmed for six weeks on the first Back to the Future movie. And then he was replaced by Michael J. Fox. So I guess that in this universe, he was never let go from the film. It was a good change. This created a ripple effect where Michael J. Fox was the lead in Footloose instead of Kevin Bacon. And Kevin Bacon took Tom Cruise's role as Maverick in Top Gun. Well, if you were directly above him, how could you see him? Because I was inverted. But this is not just a random Easter egg. Eric Stoltz was famously fired from Back to the Future because he played the role too dramatically when it was a comedy. In fact, at the very first table read, the ending of the movie kind of freaked him out, as explained in the excellent Nacelle series, The Movies That Made Us. Marty, everyone that he knows, remembers a life that he didn't live. You know, he has to live the rest of his life pretending to be someone that he's not. And this is exactly what happens to Barry in this movie. He returns to his new timeline and has no memory of this new life that he has led. So with Barry no longer having his powers, he's letting Barry too borrow his ring suit. Now, this ring suit comes straight from the comics, first appearing in the 1956 comic Showcase number four. The way the suit works is the suit is condensed within the ring, and when it shoots out, Barry uses his super speed to change into it. When Barry hands Barry to the ring, Barry too makes a Lord of the Rings reference by doing a Gollum impression. Precious. And then we get the invasion of Zod. And on the TV screens in this cafe, we see the exact same message that Zod gives in Man of Steel when he arrives. We then learn that Barry was actually on the ground at the Battle of Metropolis, similar to how in Batman v Superman, we saw Bruce Wayne's perspective of the attack. Barry is wearing a very amateur suit like that of many superheroes in their early days of crime fighting. He's wearing a helmet with wings that are reminiscent of the original Flash design from the early comics when he was Jay Garrick, more on him a little bit later. So with the arrival of Zod, Barry begins trying to form the Justice League. Clark Kent has yet to reveal himself to the world as Superman, and when Googling Victor Stone, we see that he has yet to become Cyborg and is still playing for the Gotham City Wildcats, just like we saw in the origin scene of Zack Snyder's Justice League. And it's possible that in this universe, he never becomes Cyborg, and a search for Wonder Woman only turns up a show in Vegas. And when looking for Arthur Curry's Aquaman, Barry finds his father, Thomas Curry, played by Boba Fett himself, Tamira Morrison. Only in this universe, Thomas never met Queen Atlanta, and so Arthur was never born. So instead, he named his dog Arthur. I like Aqua Dog better. 10 out of 10 would watch that movie. But there is one member of the Justice League that still exists, Batman. We hear this alternate timeline version of Patty utter the iconic line, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. You sound like Cookie Monster. I'm Batman. That's Batman. Barry and Barry go to find Bruce Wayne and we see a very different Wayne Manor than Barry is used to. Instead, we have the Keaton era Manor sporting those iconic gargoyle statues. And later we see the classic Wayne Industries logo from the Keaton films. When the Barrys enter the mansion, we see old warrior armor just like we saw in the original 1989 Keaton Batman film. We also saw that Ben Affleck's Batman collected warrior armor in the Justice League. We can hear the song 25 or 6 to 4 by Chicago playing. This is a song about writing a song and specifically how to finish it. And it parallels what we see unfolding on screen. We're about to meet a Batman who has lost his way and doesn't know his place in the world. He doesn't know how his song is supposed to end. And then there's the whole time travel aspect to the movie. We're witnessing a brand new timeline unfold and Barry isn't quite sure how it ends, but he's trying to make it end with the world and his mother both surviving. A quest that is later revealed to be impossible and Barry learns that in order to finish his song, his mom has to die. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. Then there's a brief frying pan fight, which recreates this scene from Justice League when Barry first meets Bruce. And remember, like, heroes always have to fight when they first meet. Afterwards, they all settle down so Bruce can do a direct dig at the MCU and the way they handle time travel in the multiverse. He says, you've probably seen a movie that told you if you travel back in time, you create a new splintering timeline. Well, that's not how time travel works. He even uses uncooked pasta to demonstrate what looks like an MCU splintering timeline that we see on the Time Variance Authority screens. And we've got a video coming out soon breaking down how time travel and the multiverse work in the DCU. So make sure you subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. So this Batman is broken. He mentions that Gotham is a really safe city now, which was always Batman's goal. But we're getting to see what happens when Bruce Wayne abandons every ounce of life that he could have so he can be Batman. And then what happens when all of a sudden Batman is no longer needed? When Keaton's Batman hears about Superman for the first time, he understandably has questions. You see, Keaton's Batman's history is a little messy. His series continued without him after Batman Returns, giving us probably the worst two Batman films ever made, Batman and Robin and Batman Forever. These films are generally regarded as not canon to the Keaton 
Batman universe, and this scene kind of confirms it. In Batman and Robin, we hear George Clooney's Batman mention Superman. This is why Superman works alone. But Keaton's Batman, at least this version, has never heard of Superman because he doesn't exist. And we gotta talk more about Clooney's Batman in just a bit. The suspense is terrible. He and then we finally get the return of the Keaton Batcave. It's covered in cobwebs and dust, showing us again how long this Batman has been out of the game. It also features a waterfall, which was borrowed from the Nolan Batcave. So we're already seeing these timelines kind of mix and merge together, and they enter the cave through a side entrance, which is how Bruce discovered the cave when he was a child, which also prompted his original fear of bats. We saw this in Batman Forever and in Batman Begins. We see the classic Batmobile from the Burton movies, as well as a laughing bag. Now, the laughing bag is in reference to Jack Nicholson's Joker. After falling to his death in Batman 89, Joker's dead body is lying on the pavement, but we can still hear his eerie laugh. <laughs> So, Commissioner Gordon finds a little gag bag with a Joker laugh coming from it. Now, a common idea in this era of multiverse films is the idea of things that have to happen in every universe. The MCU talks about absolute points in time, such as the mandatory death of Doctor Strange's Christine Palmer, or the fact that Lokis are destined to be evil. The Spider-Verse films recently introduced the idea of canon events with the death of Uncle Ben or a police captain like Captain Stacy. These are events in every universe and every timeline that always have to happen. In The Flash, we learn that there's a similar rule that are called inevitable intersections, such as Batman having an Alfred. Barry notices that Keaton's Bruce Wayne also had an Alfred when looking at an engraved pen that he found on Bruce's desk in the Batcave. When Bruce decides he's going to help the Barrys, we see this scene from the trailer where he places his hand on this picture of his parents opening up a room full of bat suits. So let's break down these suits going from left to right. This suit has holsters on it, so I think it could be referencing the Flashpoint Batman from the comics that was actually Thomas Wayne, Bruce's dad. Next, we have this gray and blue suit, like the suit from the classic comics that also seems to have inspired Ben Affleck's bat suit color scheme from the first act of the film. This is the suit from Batman 89 with burn damage from when he crashed the Batwing. And this one looks like a scuba suit that may have been inspired by the scuba Batman action figure from the Batman Returns toy line. And then we have a suit with goggles and a hood. Now this could be the Keaton version of the nightmare suit that we saw Ben Affleck's Batman wear in the apocalyptic future in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Keaton suits up in the center suit that you'll notice is almost all black apart from the yellow in the Bat logo. Usually Keaton's Bat suits had a yellow belt, but this one swaps it out for a black one. When the iconic Batwing from the Keaton films lowers, we hear mm, that classic Danny Elfman score. And then we hear Keaton utter his famous line. Yeah. I'm Batman. Batman pulls an MCU and jumps from a plane without a parachute and uses his cape as a glider, just like we saw in Batman Returns. <sighs> And now we meet Kara Zor-El, AKA Supergirl, the cousin of Superman. Later in the film, she mentions that she and other Kryptonians were sent to Earth prior to Clark and were going to be tasked with protecting him upon his arrival. And this lines up because in Man of Steel, Clark finds a crashed Kryptonian ship that arrived before he did as a baby. And it's even been confirmed by director Zack Snyder that this busted open pod belonged to none other than Kara Zor-El. However, I have to point out that that original concept was saying that this was a Kryptonian colonization ship that was sent to Earth like thousands and thousands of years ago. Kara's prison completely blocks her off from the sun to leave her in an extraordinarily weak and malnourished state. Superman was found in a similar state in the Flashpoint comic. Yeah, why is she all malnourished? Oh, well, Doug, Kryptonians' energy levels are greatly affected by the solar energy. On Earth, Kryptonians become godlike beings in the presence of our yellow sun. As Barry too says, she's solar powered. When escaping the facility, Batman pulls out a tape measure from his belt and asks how much everyone weighs so that he can properly rig an explosion to catapult them away from the bad guys. This is an amazing callback to this. How much do you weigh? About 108, I think. You weigh a little more than 108. When Kara is re-exposed to the sun, her body begins to regenerate, like we saw Clarks do in Batman v Superman after an up-close and personal explosion with a nuke. When Supergirl is recharged, she experiences similar symptoms as Zod's Kryptonians when they were exposed directly to Earth's atmosphere. She even asks if it's always this loud. What have you done to me? My parents taught me to hone my senses, Zod. We then see Kara go on her very first flight, and it's very reminiscent of Superman's first flight in Man of Steel. So, Barry trying to give himself powers in an electric chair is lifted straight from the Flashpoint comic. And, just like in the comic, he almost dies after the first try, but insists on going again. The Flashpoint comic also saw Barry mucky with time and inadvertently creating a world-ending event, a war between the Amazons and Atlantis, but here it's replaced with Zod's invasion. When Barry too is in need of a suit, we see him repurpose one of Batman's old suits, and we see him having trouble turning his head, which is because the Keaton suits were like thick rubber condoms. The Dark Knight trilogy even poked fun at this. You want to be able to turn your head. And before heading off for battle, Keaton utters yet another iconic bat line that he made famous way back when. Let's get nuts. This is, of course, in reference to this. You want to get nuts? Come on! 
Let's get nuts. And just a reminder, everyone, check out our merch store for your very own Doug Let's Play Fetch shirt. There's a moment in the final fight where Barry twists the mask of other Barry's suit, which seems lifted from this panel of JLA Year One, when Flash was mocking the Black Canary for having an impractical costume, so she blinded him with his own mask. On the battlefield, we see Supergirl, Batman, and the Flash as go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Zod's army in the same desert where Clark turned himself over in Man of Steel. And there are moments in this battle that are shot just like Man of Steel, with a succession style zooming in before succession was even a thing. Barry creates a cyclone, a move that we've seen Flash do many times in the comics. This could also be yet another Looney Tunes reference, this time to the Tasmanian Devil or to the DC hero from Black Adam, Cyclone. When Barry 2 becomes overwhelmed by the speed of the Kryptonians, Barry 1 assures him that the Flash is faster, confirming that Barry must have won his race with Superman from the post credit scene of the theatrical cut of the Justice League. We learn that Superman never made it to Earth in this new timeline and that his pod was intercepted by Zod. But it turns out that the codex Zod wanted and that he thought was within the blood of Superman was actually actually in the blood of Kara Zor-El. Hold on, what's a codex? I haven't seen that Man of Steel movie since before I was born. Wait, before you were born? Yes. I'm the Flash now and can time travel. All right, okay, okay. So the Codex is like this genetic coding that Zod needs to terraform Earth into the new Krypton and give rise to a new era of Kryptonians. In Man of Steel, we're led to believe that Superman is this Codex, but in this universe, it was Kara Zor-El who had the Codex in her blood all along. The whole time, the whole time, you would, the whole time. During the battle, Barry 2 says, let's emperor this guy when he learns that he can use the speed force to shoot lightning from his hands. <laughs> Okay, so the gut punch comes and we have to watch Batman die multiple times. But when Barry finally realizes that there's no scenario where they're able to beat Zod and save Supergirl and Batman, we get a scene that reminded me a lot of this Luke and Vader moment from Return of the Jedi. Here, I've got to save you. You're already as Batman is dying in Barry's arms, Barry realizes that he can't save him, but Batman assures him that he already has. Not from death, but from a feeling of a lack of purpose. Bruce had felt alone and unwanted for years, but Barry gave him the last hurrah that he needed to find himself again and feel at peace before death. Just like when Luke is desperate to save Vader, Vader assures him that helping him turn back to the light was all the saving that he needed. So as Barry refuses to accept that this world dies, we learn the shocker that he is the Dark Flash. You didn't see that coming? Dark Flash revealing that he pushed Barry 1 out of the Chrono Bowl so he could be created reminded me a lot of this scene from Batman 89. I made you. You made me first. His tampering with space-time and refusal to let an inevitable point in time unfold is causing the entire multiverse to unravel. Just like in the MCU and the Spider-Verse films, tampering with canon events or absolute points in time results in incursions. An incursion occurs when the boundary between two universes erodes and they collide. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Universes are beginning to collide. Within those universes, we see a lot of DC characters from past films and shows. We see a black and white Jay Garrick who appears to be running through a chrono bowl of his own. Jay Garrick being the original Flash from the 1940s comics. And this Jay Garrick is actually being played by Teddy Sears who played the character in the Flash TV series. Well, kind of, it's a long story. We then hear the intro to the 1950 Adventures of Superman show and get a shot of a black and white Superman. And now, another exciting episode in the Adventures of Superman. And then we get Christopher Reeve's Superman standing alongside Helen Slater's Supergirl. Fun fact, these two never actually shared the screen together. Chris Reeve's Superman was supposed to be in the Supergirl movie starring Slater, but before production began, he dropped out. We see the Adam West Batman and can hear a Joker laughing, presumably the Cesar Romero version of the character. And then, oh, this one's so big, we got the Nicolas Cage Superman. Not the beast! Ah! So we've got like a whole video coming out breaking down the Nicolas Cage Superman story and the film that never was, but I want to let Colton tell you his reaction as somebody who went to the film not knowing Cage's cameo was incoming. Okay, so when I saw the film at CinemaCon, the first thing you see when they pop into this universe is the giant spider getting hit by laser beams and my jaw instantly hit the floor because I knew that the Nick Cage Superman movie was supposed to have him fighting this giant spider and you know, just for some reason, the producer of this movie, he, he's obsessed with having giant spiders in his movies. And in fact, when the Nick Cage Superman film was canceled, that producer went on to instead include his idea of a giant spider battle at the end of a movie in the film Wild Wild West starring Will Smith. He has an 80 foot tarantula. Also, I wanted to give a quick shout out to my mom for pointing out that the floor of the Chrono Bowl is sand, likely meant to resemble the sands of time, which is meant to parallel an hourglass and symbolize that time does run out. And that's what our berries are facing here in this scene. 
time has run out. And guys, I know that we must have missed an Easter egg or two in this giant multiversal scene because there was a lot. So please at me Ryan Airy on Twitter if you noticed anything or leave a comment down below. So the use of primary colors to represent each universe I thought was very cool. It reminded me of this image, which is used often to depict the DC multiverse. So when Barry 2 jumps between Dark Flash and Barry 1 to save Barry 1 from being stabbed, we see Barry 1's death make Dark Flash disappear because now Dark Flash can no longer come into existence. Kind of like this scene in Back to the Future. This also reminded me a lot of this scene in the film Looper, when Joseph Gordon-Levitt is playing a younger version of Bruce Willis's character. When he takes his own life, it makes Bruce Willis fade away. So I changed it. And the reason this didn't make Barry 1 disappear is because he is from a different future. Again, we got a flash time travel video coming out soon to explain that. So when Barry gets back to the future, everything seems to be intact, but it's then revealed that we got a brand new Batman. Well, kind of. He's actually an old Batman, George Clooney. George Clooney played Batman in the 1997 flop, Batman and Robin. Now, as of the recording of this video, it's still up for debate whether or not this confirms that George Clooney will go on to be the Batman of James Gunn's new DCU, starring in films like Batman Brave and the Bold, or if this whole thing was just a gag. It's worth mentioning, however, that when Colton saw this film at CinemaCon, this scene was not in it. We just see some feet step out of the car and then we cut to Barry saying, who the F is that? Yeah, and I, I was never able to place the voice that we hear when Bruce calls him on the phone to congratulate him on his dad being exonerated. It, it didn't really sound like Ben Affleck. It, it didn't sound like Michael Keaton. I never noticed it to really sound like George Clooney either. And the reason that I mentioned it didn't sound like Michael Keaton is because set photos actually revealed that they had Michael Keaton shoot this scene uh, for the movie. We have set photos of him in front of those courthouse steps and getting out of the car and all that. So I don't know if the original plan was to have this new timeline resurrect Keaton's Batman, or was that just like to keep the real ending from getting spoiled and you know, hide the fact that it was going to be George Clooney. Your guess is as good as mine. All right, Colton, thank you very much for that. Guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.